We're visiting the Atlanta studio of Jim Yarbrough, who's been painting here for a very long time. He's here to show us how to make old styled gesso with rabbit skin glue. There'll be loads more information on the blog post. I'll put a link down below. Hi, I'm Jim Yarbrough. I'm going to show you today how I make gesso grounds for paintings. You'll need rabbit skin glue, a white pigment, marble dust or chalk, and we're using kale and clay for a brightener. Also, you'll need a double boiler and a nice soft brush. Rabbit skin glue doesn't actually come from rabbits. It's actually a byproduct of the meat industry, so no bunnies killed here. You have to cook it though because it comes in a crystalline form and it has to absorb a lot of water and get bigger and ooier and gooier because it's really being used as glue here. Okay. Jim has put about a quart of water into the pot. Now he's going to turn on the heat and heat up the water. Not entirely to boiling, but hot enough to melt the uh, glue. So, oops, you need to handle it by the handle with a double boiler because otherwise you'll get a big mess, but it's not that difficult to do. Now he's let it heat for a long time and we're coming back to it to see if it's ready. He's a little reluctant to feel it because he doesn't usually, but I asked him to, so there it is. Hot enough? Pretty much. Now this is the boring part. Jim is going to put in four, five, six heaping tablespoons of rabbit skin glue. It's very variable depending on the humidity in the air and the temperature of the water and the time of the month and all of that. So you, it's not a specific formula. You can keep playing with it until you have it. And all you really want is rabbit skin glue because that's the actual sealer and the actual thing that you're putting down to keep the paint from going through to your surface. But the rest of the stuff he's going to add after this will make all the difference between just a glue and something you can paint on. So here we are stirring it after it's been dissolved. It's a little thick, just a little like light syrup, like milk, but it's still thick. So here we go with the rest. Okay, the next thing we're adding is marble dust. It's also called chalk. It's, they're both the same thing. The difference is in the grind. So you can get a very coarse chalk marble dust that you can use for gesso underneath pastel paintings, which is what Jim is making this with. You can also use a very fine powder that's more like baby powder, and that will do just as well for a very, very smooth surface. Marble dust is one of the fillers we use. Also, the kale and clay is a filler, but it helps to bulk it out and make it so that you use slightly fewer coats to make a nice surface. Again, all this information will be written down in detail on the blog, including where you can get this stuff. So the next thing we're going to do is add zinc oxide, which is a white pigment. You can use zinc or titanium or even lead white if you're so inclined, but you need a white pigment in there to make the color. And you put in, I'll count up for you how many of these you use by the way you stir every time. Now Jim's going to use kaolin. Kaolin is used in the cosmetics industry as an ingredient of face powder and in, in food and all sorts of things. So we're using food grade just because it's ground very fine. It's not nano ground, which could be dangerous to your lungs, but it's ground well enough that it makes a nice smooth surface. But this is the last of it. He'll stir it up real well and then he can let it sit. All right, we're making gesso here, which has been used for centuries on various rigid panels, usually wood in the current century on products like masonite and plywood for a good ground for tempera. It's good for encaustic as well as various other 
water-based, and occasionally oil-based media. I've used it for years. It's been used for hundreds of years, and it's a really dependable ground, as long as it's on a rigid surface, such as masonite or plywood or wood panels. Wood panels were the uh, most traditional material back in uh, hundreds of years ago. I have to use quite a few coats of gesso so that it will give you a brilliant white surface that'll give you a lot of reflective quality. Usually it takes about uh, six to a dozen coats of gesso to give you the kind of surface you want. And if you happen to want a really smooth surface, you'll have to sand it frequently as you're putting it on so that you don't get a lumpy surface. Although I must admit, I often enjoy a lumpy surface to paint on. This is the second coat while it's wet, right after Jim's finished with it. And there it is dry. You'll notice it's really streaky and you can see right through it. The third coat, equally as thin, shows a little bit of coverage. If you look down into it, it's still pretty ratty. And when it's dry, it doesn't look any better. So keep going. This is looking a bit better. It's wet, you can see, because it's shiny. And then when it's dry, it's a bit better, but it's still streaky. Now you'll notice that Jim has been using a lot of lengthwise strokes, and you actually are supposed to vary them a great deal more than that. But he's doing this as a demonstration, so he's going to do it his way. But you should be doing coats crosswise over each other and diagonally from each other and try and get an unusual pattern in there, because otherwise it's just going to look streaky, built up, lumpy. Here it is getting thicker and thicker. It's starting to be nice looking. Once it starts to be nice looking, you can be safe in putting just a couple more coats on it because it's still just a bit streaky. But we're going to try one more time. And you can't see. But at this point, Jim figures there's no more to be done because it's a nice, thick, luxurious coat. We've listed all the ingredients in the blog post and also underneath this video in YouTube to show you where to get stuff. We'll be doing more videos, so keep in touch as we get better and better at this.